Okay, so we're back. We're going to tell the story of the basal ganglia and the dopamine pathways within the basal ganglia. So we have the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. First we'll go over the direct pathway. This is the stimulatory or cholinergic pathway. So we have the cortex is going to send a stimulatory signal to these neurons in the striatum. These neurons have dopamine 1 receptors on them. So they receive a dopamine signal from the substantia nigra as well at those dopamine 1 receptors. Once those neurons in the striatum are stimulated, they're going to send an inhibitory signal to this SNRGPI, which means that this SNRGPI is going to be inhibited and process number three is not going to occur. So the SNRGPI is not going to inhibit the thalamus, which results in disinhibition of the thalamus so that the thalamus can go on and release uh, motor stimulatory signals back to the cortex, which initiates movements. Okay? All right. Next we have the indirect pathway, the indirect inhibitory pathway, and it's dopaminergic. So just straight off, we're going to say it's inhibitory, so we're going to be inhibiting movements in this pathway. Okay, this pathway is a little confusing, so just keep that in mind. So here we have the cortex. It's going to send a stimulatory signal to the neurons in the striatum. These neurons have D2 receptors on them. They're going to receive a dopamine signal from the substantia nigra. And when they do, the neurons of the striatum are going to send an, in, an inhibitory signal to the globus pallidus externa. Okay? So the globus pallidus externa is no longer going to carry out, carry out process number three here, so it's no longer going to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so if the subthalamic nucleus is disinhibited, that means that it can go ahead and carry out process number four, which is stimulating this SNRGPI. So if the SNRGPI is stimulated, process number five can occur. Process number five is an inhibition of the thalamus, so that the thalamus can no longer send out motor stimulatory signals back to the cortex. So that's how you inhibit movements. All right, so when does this become a problem? So when you're taking typical antipsychotics, they can either be high or low potency. High potency typicals like trifluoroperazine, flufenazine, and haloperidol, or low potencies like chlorpromazine or thioridazine, those block D2 receptors in the striatum. So they block this D2 receptor signal here. So process number two never happens. So the globus pallidus externa is disinhibited. Okay? Got that? So if the globus pallidus externa is disinhibited, process number three can occur now. So we're going to go ahead and in inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. So if the subthalamic nucleus is inhibited, it will no longer carry out process number four. It will no longer stimulate this SNRGPI. Okay? And if it no longer stimulates the SNRGPI, the SNRGPI will no longer stimulate, will no longer inhibit the thalamus. So the thalamus can go ahead and send out motor signals to trigger movements. And that's how these typical antipsychotics result in these movement disorders. So when they block those D2 receptors, they block the inhibitory dopaminergic pathway. Or they disinhibit the movement inhibitor, which is the SNRGPI. All right. Or you could just forget that. So what that leads to is direct stimulatory cholinergic pathway, the one over here, the one that stimulates movement, that pathway is unchecked. 
leading to extrapyramidal symptoms. Now, they develop in four hours, four days, four weeks, and four months. You get different flavors of EPS. So after four hours, you get acute dystonia. Four days, you get akathisia and restlessness. Four weeks, you get bradykinesia and Parkinson's-like symptoms. After four months, you get tardive dyskinesias. Now, what do we do uh, about those symptoms in somebody that has to take a, um, a typical antipsychotic? A typical antipsychotic. <laughs> so these ACH signals that are coming back to the cortex, if you come back up here with me, these ACH signals that are coming back up to the cortex, we can block their receptor, this M1 receptor. And when we do that, we do it with benztropine. So since they're blocking an M1 receptor, benztropine is going to be an M1 anti-muscarinic. See the M? And that will prevent cholinergic stimulatory signals from reaching the motor cortex. And therefore, you're going to have a lot less of these movement issues associated with your um, typ typical antipsychotic. And that's all we have for now.